This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1085, recorded on February 2nd, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent, and hello, Rich. Um, let's see, I do my usual now. I'm looking out the window. It's cloudy. It's overcast. It was raining uh, earlier today in the high 30s, so we didn't have any snow. Um, it's supposed to rain most, most of today. But tomorrow, of course, it's supposed to be beautiful in the high 40s with lots of sunshine. So, really, that's the lots way it of goes. sunshine. That is the way yeah. it goes. Here in New York, it's six degrees and raining. Yeah, the big story from my perspective is that last night, the New York Knickerbockers, a basketball team that hasn't performed very well over the recent past, uh, has now won nine straight games. And last night, they beat the Indiana Pacers. And they average 122 points per game, and the Knicks held them to under 100 points. So um, I'm a big Knicks fan that goes all the way back to the 70s when they won a championship. So. What is he, Spike Jones? Uh, <laughs> no, that's Spike Lee. <laughs> Sorry, Spike Lee. <laughs> no, no, I'm not Spike Lee. <laughs> I got my spikes mixed up. That's also. quite all right, quite all right. I don't blame spikes for just COVID. Come on. <laughs> that's right. He's also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody, Vincent and Dixon. Man, we, we, we're a skeleton crew today. <laughs> skeleton. That's right. <laughs> um, I, yeah, at any rate, uh, 66 degrees and uh, drizzling. Tinkerbell is not here. And um, uh, we got rain in the forecast. Looks like uh, if the forecast is correct, that rain is going to fall on the Highland Lakes, which is important because that's where we store our water. So that's all good. I'm happy about that. If you like our work here on TWIV and all the other programs, you know we have nine podcasts in different fields of science. And if you if you like any of them, please consider supporting us. You know, we're putting out real science, the truth, and uh, we need your support for that. Microbe.tv slash contribute. I want to tell you about a meeting, a meeting in Australia. It's called Viruses of Microbes, VOM. So VOM 2024. Uh, it is um, going to be in Cairns. Cairns, Australia. You know Cairns, Dixon? Have you been to Cairns? I, I haven't been to Cairns, but I know it's on the Gold Coast, and it's a big tourist attraction. It's like Miami yeah. Beach. It says, join us in Cairns and discover the natural beauty of tropical North Queensland as you experience the spectacular Great Barrier Reef and lush rainforests. You can go to their website and see all the cool things you can do up there in Queensland, tropical north Queensland. You can see uh, flying foxes also. They're all over the place. Oh, you think I'll see some? Oh, yeah. Are you going to go? Yeah, I'm going to go and do a TWIV. Oh, I, you know, go out and... Um... Asked to see the uh, flying foxes. They, they're quite impressive. <laughs> they, this meeting is from July 15th through the 19th this year. And ah, I believe that's their that, winter. That is their winter. Yeah, but on the coast, I think it's still warm, right? Oh, up in Cairns, it's warm all year. That's right. So uh, also Jolene Ramsey is going. So um, oh, wow. we, we will do a TWIV together, maybe two TWIVs. Uh, anyway, if you want to go to the meeting, and if you want to submit an abstract, that would be good. The deadline is Friday, February 16th at uh, 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, which is UTC plus 10. <laughs> and then the early bird re registration deadline for the meeting itself is 5 p.m. Australian EST on Friday, May 17th, 2024. The website is vom2024.org. It's pretty cool. It looks very nice. Are they going to cover protozoans also? Viruses of microbes. So protozoans will fall into that category. Yeah, I mean, bacteria, archaea. Sure. Oh, I got it. 
protists, right? Is a protist the micro? Protist, protist is we? Yeah, it is. It didn't it's Rich my, is it's, tilting it's his small. head. He doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think of our double stranded RNA viruses that uh, infect like toxoplasma. And, uh, is toxoplasma a protist? Yes. Is Giardia a protist? Yes. Is Shigella a protist? No. It's a it's bacterium. A <laughs> what about, um, give me a multicellular parasite, Dick. A multicellular parasite? Sure. Like, uh, worms. Uh, any, uh, any yeah. Worm. Is, uh, is a tapeworm a, par- no, a um, no, no, protist? No. No. no, no. no, 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 no sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So don't forget, uh, Amy Rosenfeld, that the FDA is still looking for a research assistant. And uh, this is at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Review. So it's a research arm of the FDA, and you can work on enteroviruses. And she has discovered these cross-species antibodies. Very interesting. In other words, antibodies against poliovirus will block infection with rhino. It's not supposed to happen, but it does. So she wants to know what, what it means. So you can help out there with uh, work under BSL conditions, like cell culture, animal models, and so forth. Over in the show notes at, at uh, microbe.tv slash twiv, there will be a link to a PDF where you can read more and find her email. And don't forget to go over to daypommier.com and purchase Dixon's book, The New City, and learn why we have to fix our cities and how we can do it. What do you have, three pillars or four? I forget, Dixon. Four pillars. Let's go through them again. What's the first pillar? Carbon, Carbon sequestration. sequestration. And second, water. Rain, rain harvesting. Right. Third. Food production. And fourth. Renewable energy. Renewable energy, like windmills and sea, sea, sea things. Right. What do you call those things that harvest the wave energy? Is that a name? Is there a name for uh, that? Wave energy. Well, no, wave harvesters, I guess. I don't know. There aren't you know what I'm talking those. about. They put things under yeah. the... Ocean, and then when the waves come, it moves the paddles, right? No, or, or that it goes through them. Uh, there's a bunch off the coast of, yeah. of, of Glasgow uh, in uh, Scotland uh, being tested, and they work beautifully. Uh, they're, they almost look like uh, submarines, except they're floating. Mm. And they the, the water flows through them, which is uh, clever, and they're anchored, of course. So they're like uh, turbines of some sort. They are turbines, in mm. fact. Dixon, I bought your book. It's I have not yet read it. I will. It's sitting on my. Rich, uh, on the my, check is uh, in the mail. <laughs> co- copy. In my. Uh, it's sitting on my um, uh, table. Uh, I have looked through it. Uh, uh, the comment last week was that it had lots of pictures in it. It sure it does. does. It does. They're cool. It does. Yeah, it's a so coffee it looks, table it looks book. Great. Right, Dixon is a coffee table book, right? Uh, well, no, it's not, not, not. It's not big yeah. enough for that. It's a quick read book. That's what it is. Okay. You can sit down and digest this book in two nights. I, uh, yeah, it's that's ba- the kind of book I need. It's ba- <laughs> it's a, that's the only kind of book I can write. <laughs> yeah, Dixon, if you're a termite, you can digest it really quickly. You can, but only with the help of microbes. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have a few news items here today for you, as usual. Uh, can First I do is- my... Uh- I'm sorry, Ken. Yes, please, right. Rich. Talk about Ken Burns. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. There is a uh, passing of note and of special significance to me, and that's Ken Burns, uh, who died a week ago today. Um, I got the notification from my old, uh, the chair of my old department, where Ken uh, was still an emeritus professor, uh, just the day after we recorded the last twiv. So we were, in fact, talking about Ken on the last episode because we were talking about AAV, and he was yeah. really a pioneer in AAV gene therapy and in uh, AAV biology. So I wanted to uh, – Ken was a – I would call him a good friend, okay? Uh, and uh, I wanted to pay a little tribute to him. Ken did an undergraduate degree at Harvard, an MD-PhD at Johns Hopkins, who's a pediatrics intern also at Hopkins and did a fellowship for a couple of years at NIH, uh, all before taking up uh, an assistant professorship at Johns Hopkins. And he was at Johns Hopkins as an assistant, then associate professor until 1976, at which time he took over uh, the chair 
of what was then the Department of Immunology and Medical Microbiology at the University of Florida. That is the precursor, or it's the, you know, it was renamed, but it became my department, Molecular Genetics and Microbiology, but that is before my time. Um, but Ken really made that department what it is, among other things, by uh, hiring a whole slug of virologists. Some of them from his old haunts at Johns Hopkins, including uh, Bill Houseworth, uh, who was a pioneer in the AAV retinal gene therapy, and Nick Musichka, with whom he, uh, they, they sort of uh, together developed uh, AAV as a gene therapy vector. Mm. So uh, Ken was uh, chair of the department at UF uh, for six years until 1984 when he moved to um, um, uh, Cornell Medical College in New York. Uh, and he was there for 13 years until 19 1997 as chair, once again. And then he moved back to Florida uh, and became dean of the College of Medicine in 1997. And he served in that position for five years until 2002. And the last two of those years, uh, he was not only the dean, but also the vice president for health affairs. All this time, he's got a lab going, okay? Uh, and a bunch of other stuff, as you will hear. Then he had a brief stint back in New York as CEO of the Mount Sinai Medical Center for just over a year. And then he moved back to Florida again to become the director of the Genetics Institute, which was in fact his brainchild while he was, uh, was dean and he wound up uh, being a director. And he retired, I'm not sure when, uh, I think about 2013, because one of the things I really remember, he maintained an office uh, in the department uh, uh, indefinitely until, uh, you know, following his retirement and uh, maintained activity in the scientific community. He used to come to our lab meetings, okay, <laughs> which uh, was great. It was just fantastic because, you know, he wanted to maintain some connection with, you know, fundamental laboratory science. Ken was a past president of both the American Society for Microbiology and the American Society for Virology. He was a member of the National Academy, the Institute of Medicine, the AAAS, and uh, a whole, I have in my notes a gazillion other committees and honors of note, but I picked out of that that I thought was amusing. He was president of the Harvey Society for, for a term. Scientifically, he's known as a uh, pioneer in understanding the basic biology and life cycle of AAV. Uh, and also, as we've already discussed, he was, along with Nick, Nick Musichka, pioneered the use of AAV as a gene therapy vector. So his uh, science was um, uh, remarkable. And during over the course of his scientific career, he had an N uh, NIH Merit Award, and he was a Hughes investigator for a while as well. For me personally, he got me out of more than one jam, <laughs> for which I really appreciate. He was always ready to help anyone. He never said a bad word about anyone. As I said, he always attended our uh, lab meetings. So, you know, as I said in a tribute to him some time ago, um, when I it, it used to be that Ken, uh, Ken just scared the crap out of me because of all of these. You know, he was such a big shot, and he was everywhere, and he did everything. You name a committee, he was on it, okay, uh, really casting a, a, a huge influence. But, you know, you got to know him, and he was just your buddy, all right? Just a really, really nice guy. He was 85 years old. Uh, he survived by his wife of 60 years, Laura Burns, mm -hmm. and uh, two children, and a gaggle of grandchildren. I don't know how many. So Ken will be sorely missed. Uh, I'm grateful to have known him, and I'm grateful for what he did for science and for his friends. He was a good guy. I met him many times. Yeah. Hard not to meet Ken if you're in the field. <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> he was everywhere. Remember the first time I went to Cornell and gave a seminar, it was many, many years ago. The last appointment of the day was in his office with him. And he said, okay, you want to cut the phlegm? Uh, that sounds like scotch to me or something. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> Pulled the bottle out of his drawer. <laughs> yeah. Cut the phlegm. <laughs> All right. All right. Back in the news, pig virus. This is from Science. Pig virus imperils food security in Borneo. African swine fever 
is devastating pig populations has been in Asia. Uh, but on Borneo, which includes Brunei, a Malaysian state of Sarawak and Sabah, and the Indonesian Kalimantan, bearded pigs were once the most numerous land species, and African swine fever has led to population declines of 90 to 100%. The loss of pigs disrupts food security and ecosystems and threatens other dangerous wildlife. They have a picture of a bearded pig here. It's just, you can see its eyes that like Angela was talking about last time, those eyes looking at you. Look at He's him. a very wizened looking dude. So cool. Yeah. Um, so that's unfortunate. Dixon, you were saying something, but you were muted. So I don't know what you said. I didn't say anything in particular. I just uh, laughed at uh, your description of the pig. He reminded me of Dr. Seuss's character, the uh, Lorax. Yeah. You know, looking at yeah, actually, the front yeah, end of right. it, looked a little like you're the right. Lorax. You're right. But pigs, besides food source, as I was telling Vincent before the show started, uh, pigs in Papua New Guinea are used for money as well. They're considered a source of wealth, like uh, the Maasai consider cattle as a source of wealth. And at the end of the year, whoever has the most pigs becomes the leader of the troop. Uh, the entire, whichever consortium of pig raisers there are in that particular area. Papua New Guinea has an unusual geography in that the mountain ranges are so high and so steep for the valleys that it separates people. And there are about 1,500 different languages that are spoke on that island. It's a big island, of course. Uh, but some of the groups are united. And uh, they uh, trade pigs, and they, when you get married, you inherit pigs. And the pigs are not just eaten. They are um, considered valuable as a source of uh, social status. So it's going to disrupt not just their food supply. It's going to disrupt their sociology as well. Also the ecology. These pigs had, they were important seed predators. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Were ecosystem engineers. And then they say, without pigs, people are going to hunt other animals that are endangered. So, well, that's so African swine fever is a, a nasty bug. Yeah. Um, it is a member of the NCLDVs, nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses, that also includes a lot of the things we've talked about pox viruses, iridoviruses, um, uh, all the giant viruses. Uh, so large double-stranded DNA and an icosahedral virion. I used to think of it as pox virus and iridovirus clothing. It's on a phylogenetic <laughs> branch of its own out there. And it it's, has a stable relationship with some pig species uh, in Africa and warthogs in particular. It's transmitted mm -hmm. by ticks and it replicates both by in the ticks. ticks and in the warthog by and ticks. establishes uh, basically an an asymptomatic persistent infection uh, in those warthogs and a couple of other uh, related beasts. But when it gets out into a population of swine that uh, has not seen it and has no resistance, it is absolutely devastating. And we've talked about this before. Uh, there, it's a big problem in uh, places in Europe and mm -hmm. now uh, obviously uh, in Borneo. No vaccine. So you talk about uh, viruses controlling Paris? populations of animals. Here's a great example of uh, an epidemic that could actually, uh, well, over the, the short run, I don't think over the long run, because it'll repopulate with resistant pigs. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, there'll be chaos among the uh, ecosystem trophic mm -hmm. levels. Yeah, actually, as a, 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 a small island population, right? It'll be interesting to see if these guys bounce back right. with a resistance. Right. Well, remember how separated all those mountain ranges are. Hmm. Uh, those pigs are also separated by those same mountain ranges. So hmm. um, maybe there are some pockets where the pigs are not affected. And that depends on the tick distribution also. Do you know hmm. if it's a hard tick or a soft tick? I, uh, I do not know. I, I, I better say I don't know. <laughs> rather than be wrong <laughs> oh I'm, I'm more than willing to be wrong Rich <laughs> oh I <yeah. laughs> alright we also have a measles outbreak in the UK and Europe this is an article in Nature 
drastic rise in, in UK. It's 300 cases of measles since October of last year. And you know why this is, folks? Do you know why they're uh, increasing cases? Of course. Let's <laughs> imagine you're not needling us by any chance, are you, Vincent? No, I'm not needling you. That's right. <laughs> yeah, people, people that's that's the problem. Rates. They didn't needle the kids. <laughs> so you need pretty high rates of vaccination, 95% or higher, to really protect everyone. And uh, London now, what's the rate in London? 74% of children have gotten two doses, which is what you need. That's ridiculous, wow. London. Yeah, you need. Well, they say you need ninety five percent. Yeah. So that's way low. I I presume that that's because it's so incredibly contagious, and has a really huge R factor. So one one, you know, you walk through yeah. a room where somebody's got measles, and if you're not vaccinated, you're toast. Europe, forty five fold rise in uh, Europe from twenty twenty two to twenty three. I think we talked about this last time. Forty two thousand two hundred cases of measles. In that time period, fewer than a thousand in 2022. Unbelievable. It also, is, it is unbelievable. Also, declining vaccination rates. Oh, the folks, what are you thinking? Come on, forty-two thousand up from a thousand. Do you suppose yeah. anybody will learn something from this? One would hope. Uh, uh, thank goodness, Jenner isn't alive right now. He'd be flipping out like crazy. <laughs> Well, Jenner was the was a smallpox guy. No, no, I know, Still. but the vaccine. He was interested yeah. in vaccines, right? Yeah. Uh, well, supposedly uh, the Pan American Health Organization has also issued a measles alert. That would be for the Americas, right? right. But um, yeah. I, this link is not working, so I cannot tell you anything about it. So there's measles everywhere. We told you there's measles in the U.S. There's a little outbreak. Okay, so folks, get your kids vaccinated against measles. There's nothing wrong with the vaccine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. If you want to listen to anti-vaxxers or spew nonsense, then your kids are going to get sick. They don't have to. Two cases of Bangla, <laughs> two cases of Nipah virus in Bangladesh. I almost said two cases of Bangladesh. <laughs> two men have died from Nipah virus infection. Both consumed raw date palm juice which is a risk factor. So Nipah virus is carried by flying foxes, right? the big bats, which Dixon was talking about before in Australia. They're also there. Um, but in Bangladesh, they have them as well. And the bats, uh, you know, they excrete it in saliva, urine, droppings. And a lot of people like to, Get get sap from the date palm trees, and they put those. You know, it's like a maple syrup drip thing. You put a tap into the tree, and you put a bucket on it. Right. And they leave it there. And the night, the bats come, and they drink it, and they contaminate it with virus. And then you humans will drink it, which is not uh, heated in any way, and you die because you get Nipah virus, really bad. Does every bat have Nipah virus? No, not every bat, actually. It's, it's, it varies, you know, because there are um, pulses of infection. We actually did a paper a couple of years ago on TWIV uh, about, this was actually EcoHealth Alliance sampling flying foxes in these countries. I don't know if it was Bangladesh, but it was certainly, um, I think it may be India. But th there are pulses of infection. So not all of them are infected, but, you know, Enough are so that you can pass it on, and these are there's no there's no treatment, there's no antiviral, there's no vaccine yet. Although um, there there is a vaccine in uh, in clinical trial, which is actually a Hendra vaccine. Hendra is a related virus which infects horses right. and kills them because it comes from fruit bats as well, the flying foxes. And they developed a vaccine for uh, for Hendra, and it does cross protect against. Um, Nipah. And so CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, uh, is, has been testing, has been paying for clinical trials of the Hendra vaccine for Nipah. So we may have a vaccine. The question, though, is who would get it? I mean, you just can't vaccinate everyone. Even so in these so uh, I, remember, uh, I recall that uh, there are ways to prevent the, you know, keep the bats out of the, yeah. the harvesting by netting the uh, the collectors, 
Is there? Do you, do you recall it. whether there's a, a way of processing the sap in a fashion so that uh, I mean they they specifically say raw date sap, uh, but maybe any sort of processed stuff is just not the same. Uh, I know that it's fermented and makes it alcoholic, right? To get rid of, the uh, but virus? I don't know if that can be um, if that gets rid of the virus. At any rate, this reminds me of my doctor's advice when I tell him, you know, I did this and I hurt myself. And he said, well, don't do that. <laughs> so it says here that in the NIH workshop, it says that the sap should not be drunk raw. Right. So maybe there seem to be ways of uh, processing, processing it. it. Yeah. So raw means right out of the uh, tree. Um, but you can put a cover on the collector also, yeah. and that prevents the, vap, the bats from contaminating right. it. That's the low-tech version, right? We also have a, a yellow fever outbreak in South Sudan. 30 cases from December to January. Yellow fever. Dixon, you know how yellow fever is transmitted? <laughs> I do. <laughs> hey, it is a gyp <laughs> You think it goes from pr non-human primates to people? It does, and uh, the, the mosquito that transmits it to mosquitoes is not Aedes aegypti. It's Haemagogus. It's a different mosquito. Oh, from the non-human primates to yeah, to, to the primates in the in the uh, canopy. Yeah, keep it among themselves from, by this other vector, and when uh -huh. monkeys come down and invade human habitat. They pick it up through the uh, enough, through the um, uh, Aedes aegypti, and um, mm. then they can give it back to those mosquitoes also. So it's a problem of encroachment, basically. Is that what's going on in uh, South Sudan? I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't say, say here. Because it usually starts with, with monkeys, right, or from some primate. Yeah. And then, Dixon, uh, what would happen if we got rid of all the mosquitoes? <laughs> no, gotta, no, bad things, bad things. I, I think. Yeah, I, I got to believe, uh, you know. Well, it's, a lot of populations would go out of control. Uh, so just to <laughs> clarify, Dixon, there is an, there's the jungle or the sylvatic cycle, which is where yes, the virus is transmitted right. by hemagogus among, among non-human primates. But then occasionally Correct. they will bite a human, and then you get an urban cycle among humans okay. where you have Aedes aegypti doing it. Right. Okay, because that's the urban mosquito, right? It's peri-domestic. Would I be correct in saying it's peri-domestic? You know, you're ab absolutely correct. I learned that from you. Well, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm flattered. <laughs> well, when you teach people, it is always a good thing, don't you think? You bet. Well, uh, you've taught me more than I've taught you, I can guarantee No, no, that. no. I've learned a lot of parasitology. <laughs> All right, we have a couple of interesting research papers for you. So sit down, get yourself a cool beverage, and uh, strap yourself in because, you know, basic science is always a rocky ride. That's right. Not the date, not the date fluid, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't drink any date palm sap. That's right. Unless it's been processed in some way, which we don't know of. This is Science Translational Medicine. SARS-CoV-2 viral clearance and evolution varies by type and severity of immunodeficiency. Uh, this comes from... Um, a number of people. Let's see, who are the, these authors contributed equally, Yija Li, Manish Chudari, James Regan, the first three authors, and then the corresponding author is Jonathan Lee. Looks like it's mostly from uh, Harvard Medical School and associated affiliated institutions. So, um, uh, as you know, the, um, <sighs> People who have different immunocompromised conditions don't do well with COVID. They have worse outcomes, and they don't respond well to vaccines. Um, immunocompromised individuals, we're going we're gonna to get a little granular in a moment. They can have virus for longer periods of time. The virus can evolve more extensively. Some people think Omicron came from a long-term infected immunocompromised individual. But here's the kicker. And someone wrote in to Daniel uh, the other day for his clinical update. What do you mean by immunocompromised? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, it turns out there's a lot of different kinds of immunocompromised conditions. And 
nobody has said which ones are worse for COVID, right? Right. So that's what they did here in this paper. Uh, Vincent, you said science translational medicine. What I have is a med archive preprint. Oh, it's been published. Is that right? Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, the, the paper that I linked here. So if, oh, if it I says click it's on a, the link, I get a med archive preprint. I have a science translational medicine. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Uh, paper. I have a PDF, hmm. uh, which is science translational medicine, quite clear. Okay. Uh, let's see. If you go to med archive, let's see, does it say it's been published? Let's check that out. Because they usually do tell you. Hmm. Uh, let's see. This has not been peer reviewed. That's the ar the the med archive was posted back in August. Anyway, it's published now. It's okay. clear. You want me to send you the nah, paper? No, it's okay. We'll do okay. okay anyway, here. so so they do here is they. Let's do the authors. Yeah, I did. <laughs> oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. I guess I was distracted by... Yeah, trying to that. find out where right. it was. Okay, good. Um, they have patients, 56 immunocompromised patients and 184 non-immunocompromised. And this is a nice name for the clinical trial. The post-vaccination viral characteristics study, positives. And um, they characterize them with respect to, uh, you know, the COVID... SARS-CoV-2 positivity and 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 um, uh, how long they were in fact that you'll see the the parameters in a moment but they have different kinds of immunocompromised patients they have severe hematologic oncology transplant patients okay so you can have hematologic cancers or you can have a transplant they lump those together they have and I assume the, the the transplant uh, patients are uh, basically taking immunosuppressive drugs to maintain the transplant. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And then if you have hematological tumors, you, you also are immunosuppressed. So there's 12 of those. They call those SHT, yeah, that's right. That's right. right? Severe hematologic transplant. Then they have severe autoimmune B cell deficiencies. So uh, that's 13. And then they have non-severe immunodeficiencies um, in, in this, okay? And so then, of the, course, they... So the severe... Uh, the, the um, sorry, the uh, hematological or transplant patients, they can be generally, that is both uh, cellular and humoral immunity compromised, but the mm -hmm. B cell patients would be specifically right. humoral immunity compromised. Is that the That's idea? Right. That's the idea, yeah. So it occurs to me that there are lots of other groups that they could have included. Oh, yes. So Daniel said there are complement deficiencies, there are NK cell deficiencies. I mean, just think know. of all the people being treated for various cancers, and they receive these immunosuppressive drugs yeah, yeah. Uh, all at the time. It, it, they're, they're in the millions of people. I could imagine, however, that a trial like this would be, uh, a, a study it. like this would be hard to put together. You can't do it. To it, identify it, it, these yeah. people and, and, and find the, the COVID patients, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Right. And of course, they have the non immunocompromised participants, 184 of those. Okay, so the first thing they do is look at viral dynamics in the upper respiratory tract. So take a little nasof nasopharyngeal swab and do. First, they did PCR, and I was saying to myself, you know, they missed an opportunity, but actually, they did TCID 50s. They looked for infectious virus. <laughs> so good for them. Yeah. Um, Immunocompromised and non-immunocompromised participants have similar peak viral RNA loads. This is by PCR. But what differed is the rates of nasal viral RNA decay, where the SHT group, so the, the first group, the severe hematologic transplant group, they had slower viral clearance compared with other groups. The median time to RNA clearance in that group was 72 days compared with 10 days for the SA group, 12 days for the NS group, and 13 days for the non-immunocompromised group. And then when they looked at infectious virus by a TCID-50 assay, which is basically quantifying per milliliter tissue culture infectious doses 
the SHT group again had a delay in the clearance. The median time to viral culture clearance in the SHT group was 40 days. The 40 days is interesting. So after 40 days, they don't t- detect any infectivity, but you can still detect PCR positivity out to 72 days. Huh. Okay, just pieces of RNA hanging around. Six and a half days for the SA group, six days for the NS group, seven days for the non-immunocompromised group. And that's median time to viral culture clearance. That doesn't mean you're necessarily transmitting because it may not be enough. We don't know how much virus you need to transmit. That's another question altogether. But that first group, N, uh, SHT, they have a lot of trouble clearing infectious virus. The, uh, wanna... the little uh, the graph here is kind of deceiving. It almost looks like the at least for the viral RNA, that the SA group is almost as bad off as the SHT group. But I think it's there's just a couple of individuals yes, that's who hung on there, for yeah. a long time. But yeah. the bulk of them actually cleared pretty quickly. I'm, that's actually interesting that there's a difference between those two groups in, uh, in the viral clearance. Yep. That's one of the main points, that there are yeah. differences in immunosuppressive conditions. Yeah. Uh, so... Half of the SHT and 8% of the SA participants had culturable virus uh, compared with 0% in the NS and non-immunocompromised groups after 30 days. So again, the SHT having a lot of trouble. Yeah. And the SHT group also um, has delayed RNA clearance, as, as we already said. So the SHT is set apart from the other immunocompromised conditions. So the next question they addressed is, do you see more genetic variation in the virus in these patients compared to uh, healthy control? So they do next generation sequencing to look at single nucleotide variants within each host, right? So just take a nasal wash and sequence it. And they look here in the S gene specifically. Uh, And the SHT and SA, in this case, the SHT and the SA participants had greater number of single nucleotide changes over time compared with the non-severe and the non-immunocompromised group participants. 39% of the participants in the immunocompromised group versus 12% in the non had evidence of viral nucleotide changes. So, And these are all across the S gene. So again, in, in immunocompromised patients, um, in all of them, uh, they had uh, more mutations going on in the viral genome. So but that's just, only. Be, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead, Richard. Richard. Go ahead. Go I ahead. was just going to say, I, I, I would assume that's because they have more viral particles. Well, there's the, more the rate of mutation right? is the same. Yes, but absolutely they have right. More viruses. So you're absolutely right. The rate of mutation has not changed. If I, I did think I implied that, but it's not. What you see is. More, maybe more virus, but also longer time of yeah. right. Well, this is, the, I was uh, trying to look up here because I uh, I didn't think about it earlier um, when these samples were taken. So the peak viral load is the same in all these people. Okay, so at the peak, yeah. there's not more virus. Right. Uh, if I were doing this, I might have wanted to take the samples roughly at about the same time. Well, maybe not. Okay, but I don't know if these were taken at the same time or not. But one of the things that I thought of all through this is that in terms of, uh, I don't know if this makes sense or not, that in the immunocompromised people, there's less selection on uh, maybe on, for example, the spike gene. Are you getting, uh, it, is, is there possibly more variation because they're uh, n- they're not being selected out? No, oh, I see what you mean, yeah. I don't know the the reason for that. That's a good question, but I thought I thought it was because there's a longer period of viral replication, right? It's just a matter of time, 10 C- days versus 70 days. Certainly that could certainly that could yeah. be a factor. Yeah. The other thing is that the uh, SHT people are exogenously immunosuppressed. Whereas the B cell is an autoimmune mm-hmm. that occurs within the body itself, and it was, in other words, there was are two different kinds of yeah. immunosuppression, yeah. right? Right. 
Okay. Uh, then finally, um, two, a couple more things. They, uh, they asked, do, do these patients harbor uh, viruses that are resistant to monoclonal antibody therapy? So at one point in, in the COVID pandemic, we were treating patients with monoclonal antibodies. So they looked across the S gene sequence and um, they could identify mutations known to confer resistance to monoclonal antibodies. And 56% of the severely immunocompromised participants, both SHT and SA, had amino acid changes that confer antibody resistance, and none, no changes were found in either the non-severe or the non-immunocompromised groups. Now, the numbers are small here, right? <laughs> so you may say, how could there be none? But it's a small number. But the point is, even at a small number, five of nine of the immunocompromised and zero of 11 of the non-severe or non-immunocompromised had resistance changes. So that's quite interesting. That's a gain of function. It's a gain of function, <laughs> yes. And they also say a longer infection duration was associated with increasing accumulation of mutations. So right. that, you know, that suggests that that's a main one. So yeah. in nature, we're nature. Then you can't prevent that experiment from going on because that's an experiment of nature. No, you can't. No. And look what happened. That's right. No, but maybe the uh, maybe the political parties can figure out how to how to legislate nature out of doing gain of <laughs> well, function experiments. Well, that's experiment. the point I was raising. And the other you thing I was so? going to ask is that did any of those people um, start versions of the pandemic with these viruses that resisted? Yeah, uh, monoclonal antibodies in non-immunocompromised people. In other words, they spread this virus to other people who were immunocompetent, but when they were treated with monoclonals, it didn't it's work. Possible. Because that's it's possible. That's maybe where they got it from. Yeah, that's no, one of the possible. theories as to how this happens. Yeah. Not necessarily these individuals, but in general. Right. One of the theories about where you get these all of a sudden Viruses exactly, with exactly, a whole exactly. bunch of different changes are they've been uh, somebody who was immunocompromised cooked it up over a long period of time. They yeah. cooked it up. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So then um, what about antibody responses in general? So they look at neutralizing antibodies in these patients. And so these are antibodies that block infection. And um, they say that... Uh, the non immuno so there was a difference in no difference in neutralizing antibody titers between the different immunocompromised and non immunocompromised groups at early and late points. The non immunocompromised group had an increase in antibodies against ancestral isolates of SARS CoV two and variants of SPART CoV two, SARS CoV two. And such increase against both ancestral and variants were not seen in the immunocompromised group, right? So the, the, um, the non-severe immunocompromised group had a moderate increase in spike protein-specific antibody titers where uh, the, the um, severe immunocompromised group showed no changes. So they had to take out the people who got monoclonal therapy to really look at this clearly because the first result, which said there was no difference, they said, well, what's going on here? Ah, they, they got monoclonal therapy, right. so let's throw them out. Right. And then you see a difference between right. immunocompromised and non-immunocompromised in terms of making antibody titers. And it also, the ancestral titer uh, goes up in the non-severe, in the non-immunocompromised, and, and less so in the severe and, and the SHT and the SA. And also the antivariant spike goes up in the um, non-immunocompromised. It's 12-fold lower in the uh, immunocompromised, severe immunocompromised patients. And they also looked at antibodies against the nucleocapsid, right, because that's not affected by monoclonal use. And again, the SHT and the SA subgroups had reduced uh, increases in nucleocapsid antibody, which is really a good experiment, right, because that is in independent of right. therapy. Uh, now, now they looked at T-cell responses to in these patients, which is really interesting. This is where it gets kind of neat. Um, they first looked at T-cell effector function using an enzyme, an ELISA test or an ELISA spot test, so similar to ELISA, but in a cell format, uh, cell culture format. And um, they, they take, you know, peripheral leukocytes from patients and they um, measure 
after after giving them peptides from the viral spike, they measure interferon gamma production. That's a measure of T cell uh, activation by the by the peptide. Um, so the people in the <clears throat> non-immunocompromised group had lower interferon gamma producing units per million cells <clears throat> compared with both the NS and the SA groups. <laughs> it's interesting. People in the SA group had the highest frequencies of proliferative T cells upon stimulation with peptides, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, so um, the, um, let's see here. So I, rem I recall coming away with the impression that the people in the SA group yeah. who were B cell deficient seemed to be almost overcompensating with T cells. That's right. Is that right? Relative yes. to anybody else. Yeah, so the people with <clears throat> the SHT, the most severe, right, hematological um, transplant, they have suppression of both B and T right. cells. The people with autoimmune B cell deficiency, <clears throat> they have a heightened T cell function. Right. Which, which is helping them you know, take care of the infection it's in the absence of uh, antibodies. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, even even higher, or at least relative in in time points. Yeah, higher than the control groups. Yeah. So they say our results raise the question of whether individuals with B cell deficiencies may have a lower risk of persistent SARS-CoV-2 infection due to preserved T cell function, right. either as a compensatory mechanism or T cell priming by certain T cell depleting therapies. Isn't that interesting? So the therapy itself could could prime the T cells. So interesting. So basically the high risk group, the highest risk group, they say they could benefit from public health interventions and maybe therapeutic interventions, but even more so, you know, our results help uh, establish correlates of clearance. So I wanted to, I forgot to mention this here, is that they have a little paragraph discussing this. There's evidence that non-B cell immuno, immunity may be sufficient for clearance of SARS-CoV-2. Early in the pandemic, cases were reported of individuals with X-linked agymoglobin anemia who developed COVID pneumonia, but subsequently recovered the, despite a lack of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Right, so throughout the pandemic, we've had this discussion of uh, what are the relative contributions of the humoral, that is, antibody response and the T-cell response, and that finding at least, because, you know, it's so so much easier to measure the B-cell response. That's, that's you know, the antibody response. That's, that's right. You know, so so that's you have right. most of the data on that. Uh, but at any rate, that uh, finding that you just quoted suggests that yeah. T-cells alone could do the job. Certainly, everything else we've seen suggests that makes a significant contribution. Yeah, and in this study, the SHT patients who have B, B or T cell function, right. they're at the highest risk. Right. Um, and um, the SHT have near normal frequencies of T cell function, so that's quite interesting. And cleared the virus almost as fast. Yeah, almost as fast, that's right. Pretty much as fast, yeah. So anyway, In this case, the gain nice of function study. was in our favor. <laughs> uh, the gain of function was in our favor. Well, the immunosuppression is not a gain of function, right? No, but I mean when we uh, overcompensated <clears throat> with a T cell uh, response when we didn't have an antibody response to COVID. I see what you mean. We, got, I see. we still could do the job. I see what you mean. Okay. So I, I like that because when you say immunocompromised, you, you need to be specific oh, what you're I, talking I will, about absolutely right. right absolutely right it's even more granular than this paper but oh, oh, sorry. It's, you know it's fine okay now we have um let me fix my page display we have another uh, immunology paper in cell host and microbe intestinal microbiota programming of alveolar macrophages influences severity of respiratory viral infection and this comes from um, Georgia State University and the University of Georgia. And um, the first two authors, co-first authors, Vu No and Carolyn Lieber. And this 
comes from Andrew Gewertz, and also Richard Plemper, who was here on TWIV uh, in 2022, I think. This the is a who, tour de force, this paper. This is amazing. This is That's freaking incredible. amazing, folks. <laughs> so, like we said in the previous paper, there's a whole, there's a wide range of severity of COVID. Some of it has to do with your immunocompromised state, but there's a lot that's not explained. One is age, of course. The older you are, the the worse off. The biggest factor for severe disease is age. If you make antibodies against your own interferons, that's another factor that contributes to severe COVID. But in this paper, they hypothesize that the microbiome, our gut microbiome has something to do with it. And, you know, my, the gut microbiome is uh, participating in everything, apparently. <laughs> um, they, they cite a whole bunch of studies saying that the gut microbiome has a broad influence over a range of inflammatory diseases. For example, studies comparing mice captured in the wild with those bred for generation in labs revealed vast differences in their microbiomes, and the mice, the wild mice, had that were relatively resistant to influenza virus infection as a consequence of having this different microbiome. Eat dirt. Eat dirt, folks. <laughs> so what they do in this paper, it's a, model, a mouse model of uh, influenza virus infection. They have, uh, <laughs> they have a kind of mouse that's called excluded flora mice. So they, they lack a discrete panel of, of uh, commensal microbes in them, in their guts. And then you have specific pathogen-free mice that are often used uh, that have different microbiota. So they so so both those mice and uh, both those mice have they do have gut microbes, but they have different yeah s different populations exactly and defined right. populations. Right? They're defined. Yes, they've been defined. That's right. And what they're going to do is they're going to infect them intranasally with influenza virus. This is the 2009 pandemic strain. And um, they're going to compare them. They measure viral lung titers. They measure survival, of course, uh, and they, they measure weight loss, hypothermia. So what they find is the SPF, the specific pathogen-free mice, have reduced viral loads compared to the EF mice. The SPF mice don't have the hypothermia and weight loss that you see in the EF mice. So they say, oh, Maybe one of the microbes that's not present in EF mice is responsible. So as we said, they, we know what microbes are present in both. And one of them is called SFB, segmented filamentous bacteria. These are absent in the EF mice. These are interesting bacteria. I had a colleague at Columbia. He's still there. Uh, I think he may have been on TWIM, Ivo Ivalio, who discovered these in Dan Littman's lab at NYU to mediate this kind of uh, effect. These are really hard to grow, but um, you can you can transfer them to mice via fecal trans transplant, fecal microbiome transplants. Um, in fact, these these bacteria, segmented filamentous bacteria confer resistance to rotavirus uh, on mice. So they did some experiments uh, where they took SFB minus mice, so mice that don't have segmented filamentous bacteria, and give them a fecal microbiome transplant. What does that mean? They take feces and they, um, do they feed it to them or they, they inject it into their... Uh... Uh, I didn't actually look at the methods. I assumed that it was the same as a fecal transplant that you do in humans, where you actually uh, put it into the gut. Yeah. Right? So I mean, while you're um, talking here, I'll see if I can find out. Yeah. But so the mice, so then they can compare the infection with influenza virus. And basically, they find that if you do give them a fecal transplant from mice that have uh, SFB bacteria, you re fully recapitulate the the, the um, resistance phenotype 
that you would get if you just used mice with SFB bacteria in them. So that's the that's the model that they use. Orally administered. Orally administered. Okay. A slurry. Yeah, they <laughs> say slurry. fecal samples collected, suspended in, uh, you know, PBS, yeah. passed through a, a 40 micron filter. So those are pretty big holes. Yes. So what, what's interesting is that this protection uh, against uh, influenza virus infection in mice by SFB, it lasts three months after giving them the fecal transplant. Even though you can't find any SFB bacteria, they've gone way down, there's still high levels of protection. So that's really interesting. Remind me how long a mouse lives, Vincent? Two years, two years. or so. Yeah, about two years. So three months there. Uh, no, they're barely adults. Barely adults. Okay. All right. So SFB, there's no impact of SSB on lung tissue by histopathology, but if you have SFB present and you infect with influenza virus, there's really less influenza virus pathology in the lung. There's a one log reduction in viral titers. There's also a reduction in fever and weight loss and so forth. So they think maybe these SFB are reducing uh, infl inflammation that's induced by um, influenza virus infection. So then they say, what, what's going on here? So they look at every aspect of immunity. So they have mice lacking B and T cells. SFB still works. <laughs> so you don't need B and T cells for this. They have mice lacking an interferon system. It still works. The SFB bacteria still confers protection against influenza virus. Um, so it's not what they say, no, it's not any known candidate mechanism for, for doing this. All right, so what do you do? You scratch your head and you say, all right, let's do RNA-seq. <laughs> let's look at the RNAs that are made in the lungs of mice with or without uh, SFB in, the, in their intestines. Um, and what they find is that um, if you have SFB mice, their lung RNA, so you see all the RNA is being made in the lung. There's no difference uh, compared to mice without SFB. But when you inf infect with influenza virus, you see a big difference on, um, on RNAs that are um, uh, induced in the lung. And, and those relate to immunity and inflammation. So that's in support of their idea that inflammation is the driving force here. So then they look in the lungs of these mice by flow cytometry. They say, what cells are changing? Are there any cells that are changing, right? So hang on, Vincent. I'm going to go back yes. to this inflammation being the driving force here again. Yes. Make sure I got this straight. So what's the result again there? So you take out T and B cells, RAG minus mice, right? Okay. The SFB still protects against influenza virus infection. Right. So in the absence of B cells and T cells, you take out the in innate immune system, you take out interferon, the SFB still protects mice from influenza virus pathology. Um, so they're saying that, um, that, well, what does that leave? Some inflammatory process. Right. Okay. So the pathology, so this goes back to something I was thinking about a couple of episodes ago that we neglected to make obvious to the audience, which is that a lot of the symptomology and pathology that you see from uh, microbial infections is not direct damage by the microbe itself, but your immune response to it, the inflammatory response, et cetera. So is that what we're talking about here? Is that there's less, is that flu does a lot of damage because of the inflammatory response in the lungs, and this is a, in with this uh, SBF around, there's less inflammatory response. Is that the idea? Exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. Yep. All right. How does the right, gut so communicate with the lungs? Uh, we'll Probably. get to that. <laughs> Actually, uh, let's leave that a mystery and we'll talk about it at the end. We can talk about it, but there's no answer. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Is Nobody right. knows. But that's you know, right. Dixon, everything talks with everything else. That's true. Did that you, is true. I mean, 
Your brain talks right. to Your a lot of system. things. Well, that's that's clear because it's innervated. Actually, that's I was right. thinking. I, I my wife caught me uh, in the kitchen today, standing there, staring into space, <laughs> 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 wondering what was, she was wondering what was going on. And I was thinking up an experiment to address exactly your question. There's yeah. some, we'll, <laughs> we'll come to it. <laughs> How funny! All right. So they they take cells from the lungs of these mice and they ask. Um, what's going on and when you just infect the mice with influenza virus you get a depletion of dendritic cells and alveolar macrophages okay so if virus somehow virus infection depletes these two cell types and then lots of inflammatory cells go up and these include neutrophils monocytes and natural killer cells so their numbers go up and that explains the increased inflammation caused by influenza virus and they say the if, if, if you put SFB in these mice, um, there are only modest effects uh, on, on the leukocytes, but they totally prevent these changes induced by infection. So they, you don't see any uh, of, the, of the depletion of macrophages, and you don't see the influx of all these inflammatory excuse me, inflammatory cells in the presence of segmented filamentous bacteria. So uh, it wasn't clear to me, if it's known, why it is that the influenza infection depletes the dendritic cells and the macrophages. Is flu actually directly killing those dudes, or is there some indirect effect? Do you know? Can you talk about that in the, in the uh, discussion? I don't, rem I don't believe they're... Re re I don't know the answer. Let's wait till the discussion. Okay. I think it's there. Okay. Yeah. I'll even cheat. I'll look ahead here. Yeah. You can look. So basically, the colonization by SFB in the gut reduces viral loads, prevents changes in the cells in the lung, and reduces uh, inflammatory gene expression, um, which they have looked at also. Right? So that's the effect of SFBs. Now, they also did an experiment where they infect mice and then they treat them with an antiviral. And even at the highest doses of this antiviral, which lowers titers, viral titers by over three orders of magnitude, it reduces inflammatory cells because there's less virus there. Um, that alone, in the absence of SFB, you still see the, um, ablation of these dendritic cells and macrophages. So, so Rich, you know, that sounds like it's, they're not replicating in uh, those cells because right. even if you hit them with an antiviral, you still see um, right. reduction of those Something else cells. Something going on. And this SFB can rescue that. If you put SFB in, then it rescues the reduction of those cells. Um, uh, so somehow they say that the maintenance of these cells by SFB, that's somehow suppressing uh, infection and inflammation. You can get mice that are deficient in, in dendritic cells and uh, alveolar macrophages, so they look at those to see what SFB does. Um, and mice that lack dendritic cells, you can still protect them with SFB, but mice that lack alveolar macrophages, the SFB protection goes way down. So you need those alveolar macrophages. Um, so, but the, interestingly, if you deplete alveolar macrophages and infect with influenza virus, you don't have much of a difference in viral titers. What the depletion does is eliminates the ability of SFB to to ameliorate the infection. Right. So somehow, SFB are interacting with these alveolar macrophages in some way. Um, and, and the prevention of AM depletion, alveolar macrophages depletion after influenza virus is um, associated with uh, inhibition of uh, apoptosis and, and increases in phagocytosis. Uh, so they say SFP somehow increased the ability of alveolar macrophages to self-renew and resist uh, depletion, perhaps by apoptosis. 
Are you okay so far? Yep. <clears throat> All right. The, 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 the main place where influenza virus reproduces is the airway epithelial cells. And uh, the, the macrophages, the alveolar macrophages, protect these from infection by, by phagocytosing, for example, virus. So uh, they said, well, then SFBs sh uh, should result in lower virus in these airway epithelial cells. And so that's what they find. The percentage of lung airway epithelial cells, uh, which have detectable virus in it, was reduced by having SFB mice uh, in, in them. So, And if you deplete the alveolar macrophages in those experiments, you restore the high levels of virus reproduction in those cell types. So somehow, the way SFB is working is by allowing alveolar macrophages to persist and not be destroyed, and they protect the uh, airway epithelial cells. Yeah, so and somewhere infection. in this paper, they describe the alveolar macrophages as basically uh, lining the uh, uh, alveoli. That's right. That's okay, right. as if they're sort of the first line of defense against infection. So it makes some kind of sense to me that... Uh, in the course of the influenza, I'm trying not to be anthropomorphic here, that uh, in the course of the yeah, influenza yeah, yeah. infection, those guys would be depleted, okay? That would, that would assist in influenza getting into the cells that it wants to replicate in. So, I mean, that sounds like a whole study in itself is the yeah, mechanism sure. of that depletion. Right. Okay, so what we have here in... In mice infected with influenza virus, if they have SFB bacteria in their gut, their alveolar macrophages don't get depleted, all right? And so they're wondering what's the mechanism of this, and they say, well, maybe the SFB alters the environment in the lung, or maybe they change the alveolar macrophages themselves. <laughs> so they do a cool experiment where, you know, they, they infect mice with or without SFB, and then they take the alveolar macrophages out of them and put them in, no, in another set of mice right, right, right. that they infect. Right. And the SFB changes the macrophages in some way, so they're still able to protect the second set of mice. There are only seven authors on this paper, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Each one uh, can do us. Incredible. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's uh, also, the paper is very clearly written. You yeah. can follow it. Very nicely. Yeah, it's right. it's so without SFB, but with um, trained macrophages, you can still stop the infection. Right. That's right. So right. you if know you that them. the uh, the SSB must be affecting the alveolar macrophage. Have they That's looked right. at the uh, recruitment circle for uh, uh, <clears throat> Alveolar macrophages, as as they mature, uh, they don't they're not uh, produced in the lungs. I don't think. I think they're produced somewhere else. That's um, right. Maybe they have to. They're in the bone marrow. Maybe they have yes. to migrate through the gut first, and then they relocate. Because a lot well, of infections work this way. Yeah, they do come from the bone marrow. You know, it's interesting you you mentioned that because just last week on Immune, we did a paper. Uh, with my former student, Juliet Morrison, where they showed that when you have influenza virus infection of the mouse lungs, you recruit macrophages from the pleural space into the lung, and they uh, take care of infection. So, uh. yes, somehow, the I don't know if they encounter SFB in the gut. That's a good question. I don't think they go to the gut first. There's a way to mark those pre- mature um, sure. yeah. alveolar macrophages so you can actually see where they go, you know, with yeah. A, yeah. a small amount of radioactivity of various sorts. I think gallium or something like that. All right, so then they said, what, what genes are different between alveolar macrophages from SFB plus and SFB minus mice? So they sequence all the RNAs in these two, in these cells, in these two conditions. Uh -huh. And they say what's upregulated, what's downregulated. The most, the, the genes, the most prominent genes up and downregulated were genes that function in suppressing and activating pro-inflammatory gene expression. There you go. Right. So that's what they're saying is going on here. That somehow the SFB are doing that. 
in the macrophages. Now, among these genes includes <laughs> genes involved in uh, antiviral resistant, a complement protein, C1QA. So they, they said, what's the role of that? So they take influenza virus and mix them with alveolar macrophages. And they find that that incubation lowers the infectious titer of the virus. Hmm. And it's better if you use alveolar macrophages from SFB positive mice. So the, right? the, 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 this is a complement protein that uh, presumably is binding to the virus? Is that right? Yes, exactly right. And in fact, if you take mice that lack C1QA gene, you don't see this infect. You don't, you don't see neutralization of virus by the macrophages, hmm. even if you have SFB there. So yes, somehow they say complement C C1QA is probably binding the virus and reducing uh, its infectivity. Uh, for the uh, non-cognoscente complement. <laughs> oh. It's a complicated. bunch of very complicated cascade of uh, proteins and proteolysis yeah. that, yeah. if I understand it correctly, in the end, winds up with proteins binding to whatever the target is and either either destroying it directly uh, or uh, directing its destruction by some other uh, cellular entity. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. They punch little holes in things also. Yeah. So they think the C1Q is decorating the virus, and that enhances its phagocytosis by uh, macrophages. And it's, it works better in SFB macrophages than SFB minus macrophages. So complement is not a, uh, uh, a protein cascade that can be called upon. Uh, it's not at low levels, and then when you get infected, it goes up to high levels. It's always there. Right. It's constitutive, whereas uh, antibody production is obviously not. Um, but SFB bacteria have to sense various infections? Is, I mean, what's going on there? Don't know. No, I think they're just in the gut, and they're, they're, they're secreting things that are modifying immune cells. But I'm just sitting here thinking that... Uh, you know, I mean the uh, uh, the the bacteria aren't trying to do anything other than hang out, okay? <laughs> but it's to my benefit to give these dudes a home, okay? of course, because uh, I too. may not die of flu. Yeah, and and they'll have a host. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So these the, yeah. these are all presumed all microbes in the gut, uh, all over your body were presumed to be pathogenic at some time and biological history and they all yeah. came to grips with you know coexisting that's the hypothesis that i was taught well yeah but things things evolve together and then right. favorable right. uh favorable consequences are selected for yeah. yes right. like bacteria that make uh, vitamin uh, let's see vitamin i'm rocking k <laughs> vitamin k for blood clot. or or blood bacteria clot. that help you do better with flu, right? Yeah. Uh, or but, back well, to wait. The, uh, first of all, it's not clear that these are in people, but we'll get to that. Oh, yeah. Good point. <laughs> we'll get to that. Anyway, so the, the SFB are increasing C1Q expression, and they're enhancing the phagocytosis of macrophages, and that drives um, the reduced influenza virus replication, right? Um, and and they, can, they can confirm all that uh, experimentally. Let's see here. So the, the mice lacking, this is interesting, the mice lacking C1QA. So if you add SFB, it doesn't lower um, the, their ability to um, neutralize or reduce influenza virus infection. Um, but you do, but they do confer some reduction. So something else is going on. Right. C1QA is important, but something else is going on to uh, to to interfere there uh let's see what else one more thing here let's see what's important here well the, the last set of experiments are 
they look at the metabolic states of these um, the cells, and um, the the SFB doesn't affect the metabolic state of alveolar macrophages very much. They're measuring glycolysis, for example, but mice lacking the bacteria, the SFB. If you give them influenza virus, you get a huge increase in macrophage uh, ATP production and glycolysis, and you don't see that in uh, SFB plus mice. And so somehow they're reprogramming the macrophages not to undergo that, and they think that's linked to their uh, ability to suppress infection. Um, so uh, again, if you give uh, SFB minus alveolar macrophages to a host, a host that already has endogenous alveolar macrophages, you get modest reduction in titers, you get damage of the lungs, you get weight loss and you death. But if you get uh, uh, SFB positive alveolar macrophages, you get great protection uh, of those mice as well. Um, if you transplant C1Q minus SFB positive alveolar macrophages into SFB minus vice, you don't get a reduction in viral titer because um, you need C1QA. But there is a modest reduction in inflammation, and you get a modest clinical benefit. So, again, there's something else going on besides the, uh, the C1QA effect. So the ability of these SFBs to, to um, medi moderate infection is not just by dampened in inflammatory signaling, but it's also enhanced antiviral function that involves... Uh, C1Q. Uh, and so having these bacteria in the mouse gut uh, affects alveolar macrophages in a way that they can better protect the host from. And in fact, this also uh, applies to respiratory syncytial virus, which they look at here in their mouse model. The, uh, the SFB have the same ameliorating effect on infection with respiratory syncytial virus. So that's the story here. SFBs are reprogramming these alveolar macrophages, so they don't get depleted, they ameliorate inflammation, and they re they reduce viral titers via the complement. Now, relative to uh, Dixon, was uh, had a question previously about where do these macrophages come from, and I think they they have some experiments that they don't they have some experiments that, uh, as I recall, say that w the effect of uh, SFB, rather than influencing the evolution or the development of the macrophages, okay, mm. is actually reprogramming pre-existing macrophages. Do I do I recall that correctly? So I think I think their idea is I see that these right. macrophages are alveolar macrophages already. Correct. Correct. Okay, and the and the effect of the uh, okay. uh, bacteria is to reprogram uh, or program That's those right. macrophages that are already resident to adopt this state. Okay? That's right. So the question right. becomes, how are they doing that? <laughs> right. <laughs> From it's, a distance. It's got to be some product that they're producing. That's what they say. They say it could, they, they have two hypotheses. One is that they're producing something that travels through the bloodstream Right. And then directly interacts with the uh, alveolar macrophages. The other is that they are making something that is uh, in the bloodstream or uh, gets in somehow ultimately gets uh, influences the brain in a right. fashion so that the brain then does something to reprogram the macrophages. Okay. I'm thinking, I, I don't know how to be more specific than that. But one, what I, both of them involve a diffusible factor, pr right. presumably a protein or a small molecule. Uh, one of them involves a brain, the other one doesn't. This is why I was sitting, st standing stunned in the kitchen, okay? Because <laughs> I was thinking, I wonder if you could take macrophages and mix them with serum from either uh, SFB plus or minus mm. mice and reprogram them in vitro. Or cell culture mm. from yeah. SFB. Yeah. Well, that's the thing we didn't really discuss. Uh, you, they're hard to uh, grow, but... Yeah, because they're, they're anaerobic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> well, apparently, I guess anaerobic people can do that. 
But you, about, you know, this reminds me of <laughs> even, even back to the fecal transplant thing. We <laughs> we have discussed fecal transplant before, and it reminds you know there's so many of the gut microbes that uh, you can't culture. It certainly can't culture easily. All right? right, and there are so 1,500 species, right? Uh, and so uh, people have you know for therapies that involve fecal transplants, people have ways of trying to culture something that is like a gut microbiome. And they had this machine in Guelph that was supposed to reproduce uh, uh, what a gut was like that was seeded with um, fecal really? material, I think, to start with. Uh, and then they had a, con you know, it right. tried to mimic the environment. They called this thing robo-gut. Right, 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 right. The thing I like, so, go ahead. I just want to say that all right, so they say here that um, it's not clear that these, it says the extent to which SFB is present in humans is not well defined. It's frequently present in children in some regions of the world. It's in some adult individuals, but it's not clear that it's in everyone. And they say, you know, we were really surprised to find one bacteria could do this, but we think there are probably others that can do this. And this is kind of a model, yeah, right, for, for understanding what's going on. Uh, and they say we should, you know, understanding this this ability of the microbiome to do this is important because um, maybe we can develop um, treatments for uh, post-respiratory virus infection problems, right? So they say if we can identify what's going on here, if they can identify sure. what's being secreted by the SFB Maybe we could mimic it and, and have similar effects, right? right? So that's why this is, even though it may not be in people, the, the principle is still important. The principle important, is important, right? yeah. And they say that, you know, many of the consequences of influenza infection results from this loss of alveolar macrophages. Then you get bacterial pneumonia afterwards. That's the reason, because you don't have those alveolar macrophages anymore. Sure. So what, and, and Rich, you asked this, what depletes the alveolar macrophages in influenza virus infection, they say the mechanisms driving depletion of alveolar macrophages are not clear. <laughs> okay, good. Not clear right. means, huh? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> Deer stuck in the headlights yeah. of knowledge. <laughs> the, so, uh, we we ought to know, rewrite uh, a couple of scientific papers sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if... If it let's look it up. Influenza does influenza virus infect macrophages? Infect macrophages. I just don't think it does. Oh, some strains can replicate in macrophages. All right, so not all. So that could be part of it, but obviously they're saying it's the mechanism of depletion is not clear. So it's not just a right. matter of replication. Right. Well, so we got, the, we got a couple of serious mysteries here. How, how does sure. that happen? Okay. And how but, is it that the macrophages are communicating with uh, the gut bacteria? Right. If, if there's a lot of inflammation, there is a lot of innocent bystander effect where the cells, when they disintegrate, spread their products out, like eosinophils, for instance, then they have a lot of granules that are very harmful to the surrounding cells. And mm. they can do a lot of damage where you're actually trying to do a lot of good. Maybe that's the, when neutrophils come in, for instance, to try to clean up whatever mess was being made with the initial infections, when they disintegrate and their granules to yeah. break open, it's possible that that's what knocks off all these other cell types. That's my view only. <laughs> because when you give anti-inflammatory agents to these people that are suffering from, you know, raging diseases of various sorts, mm -hmm. you, you tend to modify the disease as sure, well. Sure, sure. So there's a lot, of, um, you know, a lot of hope that you can control inflammation and still kill off the microbes, right? Yeah, you have to just get the timing right because yeah, there's a period exactly when, right, exactly right. You know, right. for viruses, you can't give no these question. immunosuppressants during that phase. You're, remind, you're reminding me of all those discussions we had during the pandemic. Oh, oh yeah, uh, exactly right. When, exactly. Do you, when do you give steroids? When don't you? That's right. Yeah. That's right. 
the 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 gut microbiome story that I fell in love with uh, when I first read about this, which was about four years ago now, was uh, fat mice versus skinny mice. And fat mice, no matter what you did to them, dietarily speaking, nothing worked. Re, 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 withholding this, withholding that, nothing worked. If you took the microbiome from skinny mice and you completed and you wiped out the micro, microbiome on the fat mice first and then replaced it with the skinny mouse microbiome, mm. the skinny mice microbiome <laughs> reduced the weight of the fat mice. What the heck is all of that? I, I mean, what controls weight gain, of course? Everybody's interested in that, right? So the molecule of the year was uh, picked because of that, yeah. uh, because people are using it as a weight control mechanism. But what what are the what are the pardon the expression feedback loops, which control? <laughs> right. Thank you, Rich. Um, from the but, gut to but, the rest of the body, because you know the everything passes through everything that uh, you encounter in for in terms of food yeah it goes way in one end and it comes out the other and uh, everybody's is different but it That's offered it. some hope for people who were genetically obese to compensate for that by taking microbiomes from people who couldn't gain weight to save themselves yeah it's interesting to think about the evolution of, of oh, all this. That's what you make me think about, yeah, Dixon, yeah. because yeah, 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 you know, yeah, just yeah, yeah. in a in a in a very broad sense, mechanistically, uh, you know, using using gut microbiota is a way to, you know, is a way that diet can affect your overall health because yeah. the diet's going to infect the gut microbiome. That's right. Interesting. Yeah, very. I mean, it's complicated, but interesting, but still we don't know enough. <laughs> Let's do a couple of emails since we have both of you here. I moved a few around. So the uh -huh. the first one there by Jerry. Um, Rich, can you read that one? Uh, can I scroll down it should here? be the first one up there. I moved it to the top uh, right. of the list. Okay. So, a uh, very pleasant 55 Fahrenheit 13C in San Francisco Bay Area this evening. I have comments for both Dixon and Rich's picks. Dixon, I was introduced in college to uh, Peter uh, Schnickel. Is that how we pronounce it? Schickley. 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 Sorry. Uh, I had been dragged to the Pittsburgh Symphony by my mom <laughs> growing up when my dad didn't want to go, not knowing what uh, hard art was, assuming... It was some instrument I had never heard of. I just kept quiet. <laughs> juxtaposition, uh, juxtaposition this with memories as a child of visiting my aunt in New York City uh, and going to the Automat. I never right. uh, knew the name of that place, just that it was an Automat. <laughs> you put together these for a great laugh. Thank you for bringing back these memories. Sure. Uh, Rich on food genetics. I have read a few papers on the importance of fire in our evolution. Good. Uh, you are focused on meat, but I look only at vegetables, grains, nuts, which were a larger part of the evolutionary diets. One handy thing is to measure the caloric bioavailability glycemic index. More info than you could ever want around non-meat <laughs> things. And he gives a, a link for it. For meat, he gives another link for that. Finally, remember that you can cook chemically as well as with heat. Think ceviche, which is really useful uh, for things like acorns. <laughs> Apparently, my <laughs> wife gets uh, more out of her well-done steak than my juicy medium rare one. I guess she is evolutionary more, uh, evolutionarily more advanced. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you you said that nobody wrote. So now, now we're starting. Yeah, um, thank you. Okay. Right. God, Dixon, Dixon, can you take the next one? Absolutely. Um, Tim writes, Hi, Tim Tw uh, Team Twiv. Thanks for another interesting episode of the podcast. In regard to the discussion on HPV vaccination to prevent cervical carcinoma, Twiv 1083, my ears picked up when Rich, in his introduction, mentioned that papillomavirus 
papillomaviruses were first species-specific and did not infect other host species. As a veterinarian pathologist, I often come across host spe spe species, I'm sorry, I often come across cross-species papillomaviruses infections as part of my diagnostic practice. The most common example is in horses, where bovine papillomavirus 1 and 2 infects equine skin, likely transmitted by biting flies. We see the tumors most often around the external genitalia and around the face, and cause fibroblastic tumors, sarcoids, rather than tumors of the epithelium. A recent review, he cites as by Chambers, uh, Ellsmore, um, O'Brien, et al., Association of Bovine Papillomavirus with the Equine Sarcoid. It's in the Journal of General Virology. We also occasionally see a much rarer, but histologically very similar tumor of fibroblasts in cats, feline sarcoid. This is most likely caused by another bovine papillomavirus, BPV14. Monday, Thompson, Donawaska, Knight, Laurie, Hills, genomic characterization of the feline sarcoid associated papillomavirus and proposed classification as Boss Taurus papillomavirus type. 14 in the Veterinary Microbiology Journal. Um, with a, that's a recent publication, too. With all, of, of, with all the best regards, your special veterinary pathology correspondent, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Lot of, lots of letters after his name. <laughs> I, uh, I stand corrected. This is very interesting. Thank you very much. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if the human papillomavirus infects other I, species. I, I, I'm uh, asking myself this, uh, the same question. But ah. I bet nobody's looked, so who knows, right? Mm. All right, one more from Lori. Hi to our dear Microbe TV family. Can't tell you how much your work has enriched our lives. Coincidentally, The Guardian published the following article shortly after we watched this episode. Here's the link to the article and the research paper reference, thought Rich might find them interesting in view of his pick of the week. Uh, and the, the Guardian article, which is linked to, hunter-gatherers were mostly gatherers, say archaeologists. <laughs> they mostly ate plants and vegetables, according to archaeological findings, that undermine the commonly held view that our ancestors lived on a high-protein, meat-heavy diet. Now, this is looking at at individuals from two burial sites in the Peruvian Andes. Wow. And that's based on a paper in PLOS One. Uh, stable isotope chemistry reveals plant-dominant diet among early foragers on the Andean Altiplano, nine to six and a half thousand years ago. Wow. But that's, that's way after humans evolved. Yeah, yeah, it is. The still, current status, but, yeah. you know. But they're still yeah. eating vegetables, but that may be because there was no meat up there, right? Uh, well, well, there there I, were. There, there was llamas and uh, alpacas and all kinds of other. But they I, used them for their draft animals. I had okay. this uh, I had this sort of uh, email discussion with Neva. Which she, she was the one who thought we were gonna, I was going to get a bunch of uh, mail on the diet discussion because diet is such a, it's almost an emotional topic with sure, lots yeah. of people. And, uh, uh, you know, her idea is that, you know, it's probably, you know, the diet generally might have been sort of, yeah, some meat, but meat light. Okay. She said, <laughs> and her, her reasoning was, you got to be really hungry to go out there and kill a mammoth. It's a scary prospect. I think so. I think you are. Yeah, you have to be. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your work and the joy you bring to it, Lori. Okay. It's time for some picks of the week. Dixon, what do you have for us this week? Well, um, this just came out about two days ago. It's a compiling, a compilation of 19 spiral galactic centers. By that I mean, <laughs> when you look at a spiral galaxy, you see the arms of the galaxies, of course, and you see the spiral nature of the galaxy, but, and you just see a bright area in the middle. It looks like a glow of some sort. Well, the James Webb Space Telescope has the ability to eliminate the glow and just see the, the solid objects that are in the middle of things. And in fact, for a good reference, go look at the Hubble Space Telescope picture of the Andromeda Nebula, 
and then look at the James Webb Space Telescope picture of the Andromeda Nebula. And the Andromeda Nebula with the James Webb Space Telescope looks transparent. Hmm. You can see the stars behind the galaxy, which is wow. a rare, very rare. I mean, we, we couldn't do that before, right? The light would ablate that, but they have a, a, a special filter that they use to get through that. Well, at any rate, they decided to use that special filter to look at the middle part of the galaxies that we couldn't see before. Look at those pictures, and you will be stunned by their detail. And in fact, Rich, this is, I thought of you in the instant I saw it. You could almost see the black holes. Hmm. These I mean, are just when you, stunning pictures. They are remarkable. That's money well spent, man. If they don't do anything else, they have just opened our eyes to the fact that every single spiral galaxy now, this doesn't include the cluster galaxies, but the spiral galaxies have at their center a supermassive black hole, supposedly. And that's been thought about, and there is some rough proof of this, but they really haven't photographed the actual black hole, although they claim they've pieced together some different telescopes all together to give you the picture of the black hole. But you really can't see it. You can see the event horizon, and you can see the area just on the outside of the black hole. Take a look at these pictures and tell me that you can't see a black hole. They're amazing. You can imagine a black hole in all of these. and um, Yeah, I can see it. They're quite <laughs> stunning. And I would hate, hate to be a civilization that evolved on the inner arm of one of those spiral galaxies, <laughs> which got me very close to the spin-up that gets me involved in spaghettification. Which is what you <laughs> what happens to an object when it gets sucked into a black hole? It gets spaghettified. Um, <laughs> they actually had visions, videos of this on a, on a universe uh, program on the public television. Anyway, this what, where is this web now in space? It's where a million located? miles towards Mars. It's a million miles towards Mars, uh, and it's got this sun shield that protects it from the uh, radiation from the sun. Mm -hmm. And it's got five layers just to keep the sunlight from penetrating and spoiling all these wonderful pictures that they can take as the result of being almost at absolute zero. They're almost at three degrees uh, um, above the absolute uh, zero level in, the, mm -hmm. in, in space. Then they point this telescope towards all of these known galaxies. And you see these NGCs next to the numbers. That's New Galactic Catalog. There's a catalog that you can go to. You can actually buy this thing. And every one of those galaxies is listed and shown in the NGC catalog. And that's what that's all about. There's another so catalog. Go ahead. Is this going to keep going or is it going to it's a It's over? parked. Oh. It's at a Lagrange it's port. A, no, it's, it's, it's in a circular orbit that um, if oh, you I see. look out, it goes in this way, not in that way. So, so it's past it, Mars? Is it past Mars? No, 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 no. Mars it's is in a front lot further it. away than a million miles. So it's a million miles from Earth towards Mars. Okay, got it. And it's using the shadow of the Earth to keep the sunlight off of mm -hmm. the telescope, but it needs this shield to, to complete the job. I see. I see. Wow. Very but cool. you get amazing, amazing resolution. It's got 18 mirrors that are working in, in tandem. So uh, it's, uh, it's cool. remarkable, remarkable. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Rich, what do you have for us? This is definitely a repick, but I figure that <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure I picked this before. But uh, the listenership has turned over enough, and I refer to this in my mind all the time. This is just stunning slow motion photography of a great white shark attack. Oh, yes. on uh, yes. seals, okay? So this is mm -hmm. uh, oh, off, sure. uh, off the Cape of Good Hope where Cape Fur Seals have to, this is narrated, uh, what's his name? Attenborough. David uh, Attenborough. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, this is from BBC Earth. So this, um, uh, these fur seals have to uh, run the gauntlet of a bunch of sharks every day to go on their... <laughs> The, the seals on their fishing run, the sharks are waiting for them 
okay? And uh, so are the photographers uh, who got these incredible <laughs> pictures of great white sharks breaching and, uh, you know, yeah. capturing yeah. capturing these seals. So you got this giant animal breached out of the water with a seal <laughs> hanging halfway out of his mouth. But, I mean, the reason I came to this again, as I often do, is uh, our we were talking basically about uh, meat eating and the right. evolution thereof, and right. et cetera. And I uh, am always coming back to the idea that nature is amoral. Okay, yeah. you bet. nature, you bet. nature doesn't care. All right, that's right. A- any way you can, any way you can survive is just fine. And you if that it. means, if that means harvesting seals. Uh, at every opportunity, that's what you do, uh, or gazillion krill or whatever. Um, so nature doesn't care. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't um, fabricate our own morality and adjust our behavior appropriately. That's fine. But where we came from is amoral, uh, and it's vicious, I'll tell you. And this is, to, to me, one of the best examples of just how vicious it is. So there you go. Everybody got to yeah. eat. Yeah, uh, yeah. Nature is not kind, but it's all about food, right? Yeah. That's it. It's all about. Food. Actually, it's all about DNA replication. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, all right. That's true. That that's right. the that, that's the only that's our only purpose is to replicate you know DNA. Of, do you know what the goal of a bacterium is? <laughs> uh, make more bacterium. That's right. To make another yeah. bacteria. Yeah. yeah. That's I, it. You know, I I whenever I hear somebody say, you know, why are we here? My answer is that's the wrong question. Uh, it's not why are we here. It's what you, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> you make your well, own we're, purpose. We're lucky because we're at the top of the food chain, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but <laughs> someday we'll be at the very bottom of that food chain. Yeah, for, I would, yeah, for now. All right, I have two picks. Um, this February is Black History Month. So uh, there's a website, blackhistorymonth.gov, by the U.S. government, which um, illustrates all the things going on in government places, museums, and so forth, and buildings that uh, you could do, but also stories and and, uh, other things, other resources that are really nice, like black artists, cultural expressions, uh, parks, and so forth. So very nice. Very nice. Um, and then um, in an article in The Atlantic called Lost Photographs of Black America. So a bunch of photographs from the 60s and 70s were discovered in a Swedish bank vault. And they're all black and white. Uh, and they give you uh, an interesting perspective on how things were back then. Really nice photographs. There's one of a car, a Chevrolet, and the license plate says, I have a dream. <laughs> uh and um you know other other interest actually they're not all black and white but they're all there's a historical trove of photographs which is pretty uh, is cool this so just get, a, is this just a sampling yeah this is a sampling they have uh uh many 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 others i don't i don't remember how many let's see if we can find it mm. these are very cool i love i always get lost in the it doesn't say photography say, section but, uh, of any museum. Tens of thousands cool. of na- negatives. There you go. Tens Three of thousands. safety deposit boxes. Holy cow. Right. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and then we have three listener picks. Louise writes, Dear panel, I just watched this video on YouTube from a fairly reputable provider of accurate history. It's titled The Mystery of the Village That Beat the Black Death. It's obviously dated. Cue the dramatic transitional and background music. However, I truly found it weirdly charming as it stated with, as it started with geneticists and immunologists studying plague survival and then took an abrupt turn into the research into the genetic markers that give protection against HIV infection or translation into AIDS. As a registered nurse who has vaccinated thousands against COVID and influenza since 2021, and one who knows that the science depicted in this Time Capsule of Virology Research benefited us during the COVID pandemic. I recommend this video to you and would love to hear your thoughts. No one is safe until everyone is safe. 
Yours, you Louise, bet. of course. That's a quote from That's a good Daniel quote. Griffin. And then Pierre writes, I salute your efforts to educate the public and fight off misinformation. Keep up the good work. Here's another example of knowledgeable people fighting the same battle. Funny stuff. Incredible what garbage people can post on TikTok to get news. Um, Alan will appreciate this, although he probably has already seen some of Kelsey's. That's a 747 pilot depicted uh, in this video, his videos. And, and there's a TikTok person spewing nonsense about flying and the pilot is like kind of laughing and saying, yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah, shout out to Angela. Shout out to Angela from a ski patroller buddy of Michelangelo when he was still in Ottawa. So I, I wrote to Angela. I said, what does this mean? So her brother is Michelangelo, who was a ski patroller with this Pierre who wrote this letter. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. It was a small world, right? And finally, from Brandon, hello, Twiv superstars, and greetings from the Philly suburbs, where it is currently 48F, 8.8889C, and 282.039K. I was just watching a video, a YouTube video from a channel called Professor Dave Explains that I thought you would enjoy. The link I attached is a video titled, Science is Not Dogma, You're Just Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> In it, he debunks a video that is nothing more than a collection of all the worst anti-science BS you will find on the Internet. I think you will also be interested in his ongoing conflict with Dr. James Tour. It's as if someone took everything wrong with science deniers and put it all into one credible source. The majority of his content is just exclamations of explanations of science stuff in a way everyone can understand. I hope you enjoy. Yeah, I had a peek science. at this. This guy looks pretty good. Yeah, he looks very interesting. He looks like uh, another, um, uh, who's our buddy over there on the, the bunker, Dan Dan Wilson. That's right? it. Debunk the funk. Right. Debunk the funk. All right, that'll do it for TWIV1085. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us questions, comments, picks of the week to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like this work, if you enjoy our programs, we'd love your support. It doesn't have to be a lot. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And there's a couple of ways you can do that, uh, including Patreon, PayPal. You can send us a check. The address is right there. I get checks frequently here at the incubator. It's always fun to open them up and and, and see your words. So microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier, trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you, Vincent and Rich. The trifecta of Twib Twib was very successful. Man, I, this is like I, this is like the the Stone Age. That's right, Stone Age. <laughs> back, yeah. in <laughs> back in the old days. Back in the old days. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me here at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.